Twitter. It's making you stupid and sick. It's making all of us stupid and sick who use the platform. And this isn't just my feelings or opinion. This is actually backed up in scientific fact. It literally rewires your brain to become stupid and it is making you sick. You might say to me, hey, Kirsten, I use the platform for staying informed on the news. That's pretty smart, right? Being a good citizen, that has value. Being a good person, but does it? This isn't a boycott Twitter video. I don't care what you do, but I do care that you're informed. So I'm going to talk about why you might consider making a healthy step in quitting toxic Twitter. Longtime fans might be like, hey, why is she talking about Twitter? Why isn't she just shooting a gun? Well, the underlying undergrounding of my channel is all about personal freedom. And to know more about mindfully using the internet is part of personal freedom. It takes a lot to quit Twitter. It does. It's a fun platform. Don't get me wrong. But the, the detriments far outweigh the benefits. I'm just going to focus on three different aspects that are really, really important and things that you probably don't know at all. Most people do not know, especially the one aspect. Here we go. Let me tell you a little bit about the toxicity of Twitter. Twitter is a drug, an actual drug. No, it's not cocaine or heroin or whatever crazy drug, street drug is out there. But it is the most used, well, one of the most used drugs on the planet. What happens when somebody uses Twitter, you know, they go through an actual brain mechanism, a brain chemical that is similar to cocaine. So it plays on our risk reward system. We think of something, we act on it, we get rewarded for it. It's basic humanity, we all have it, nobody is impervious to it, nobody's immune to it. And what happens is it's a dopamine rush to the brain and that encourages the brain to do more of that thing and that's a good thing in a lot of areas but our brain can be hijacked in different ways so when it comes to something that could be potentially unhealthy when you look at the holistic picture it's not the best behavior to add to your lifestyle because you are literally getting slightly addicted or very addicted in some cases to whatever is giving you that hit of risk reward cycle. Twitter is the easiest way to get those hits. There's not much effort. You don't have to post a really interesting picture like Instagram or Facebook even or whatever, write a long post, create a video. On top of it, a lot of people are angry about something else in their lives and they go on Twitter and it shows. So what happens is anger. You think, well, of course I wouldn't want to go on something that gives me a negative emotion because that would be not a reward at all. That would be a punishment. So I wouldn't want to go on a platform that punishes me and gives me negative emotions, makes me anxious, sad, depressed, rips away my hope. And that's kind of what Twitter does. <laughs> but here's a little trick that our brains, brains, our brains play on us. <laughs> here's a little trick that our brains play on us. And that is, especially with anger, we can get addicted. Anger releases feel-good hormones. So a lot of times in the moment, have you ever been angry and you just want to get really angry because it feels good in the moment. You feel justified. You get a rush of endorphins and dopamine from being angry. That is not healthy. That's your brain play playing. That's your brain playing tricks on you. You would think that something that would give you happiness would be the strongest drug you could possibly imagine for your brain, but that's not the case. Actually, frustration, discouragement, anger, a lot of studies show that you are more likely to get addicted to those things. So maybe that's why some people are addicted to drama. I have no idea. Not a fan of it. But you have to train your brain in healthy ways, as a lot of people who use the platform know. Twitter is kind of an obstacle course for making sure that you don't get triggered, angry. You really have to be mindful and active about not being angry. Everything about life plays with your brain chemicals, and that can be a really positive thing. But the negative thing is that you have to be aware when something is hijacking your brain chemicals and creating unhealthy habits because those unhealthy habits still give you a reward of chemicals, but it doesn't give you a reward in life. The other thing that Twitter does <laughs> is that it hijacks your attention span and your ability to take in long form content. And that's exactly why people use Twitter. They say, well, I don't have a lot of time in my day to catch up on everything. Because if I catch up in it, on everything in a deep way, then the sun's set. 
But here's the thing. You will never catch up on everything. There are so much about life that's happening that's good and bad around the world that Twitter definitely doesn't even touch at all. It's quite annoying actually. And meanwhile, you're bombarded with all this information that seems very urgent. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening in the world. The fact is you're not getting informed on everything. You're only informed on what they want you to be informed on. And that's not true information. You're hijacking your attention span and taking in little bits and pieces and only getting part of the story or misinterpreting. It's very easy to misinterpret online, especially Twitter. Your attention span is 140 or whatever, 240, whatever they changed it to. It's very short. And I would encourage you, in fairness to Twitter, to not ever even choose a platform that is so truncated because you can choose to be succinct and efficient and have that challenge. That was one of the fun things about Twitter. It challenged me to be a little bit more creative and to make sure that I conveyed my message in a way that wouldn't be misconstrued and would be a positive, encouraging thing. But the flip side of that is it takes so much energy and it's really easy to misconstrue. It's really easy to cancel someone completely or write them off over a dumb tweet. Imagine if you did that in real life. You go down the street and you're like, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you. Um, could you tell me a little bit about you in 140 characters or less? Yeah, otherwise, I really would just shut up. I don't have time for you. You don't actually care about that person and what they think if you limit what they say. So it's the same thing with ideas. With ideas, you might think you care. You might have a little clever quip that you say. You're like, ooh, I'm going to say this. This is so clever. Maybe it's even hopeful. Maybe it's even positive. But do you really care? Here's the thing. You really don't care if you're not willing to read a long form. Most people are not even really willing to read a blog post. If you're only willing to read a tweet or a bunch of people's feelings in tweets about something that's happening, then you really don't care about it. The more time you spend with a topic and deep dive, the more you actually give a crap. <laughs> and that's okay, because we don't have to give a crap about everything. We just don't. We really don't. And you're not a better person for caring about everything, because you end up not really deeply caring about anything. So is that really care? I would argue it's not. It's kind of freeing when you think about it. You don't have to care about everything. So pick a couple things that you care about and really deep dive because that's who we need. We need people who care and deep dive. And then you can debate with the other people who care and deep dive. This shallow level of everything is not only hurting us uh, culturally, but it is also hurting us intellectually. This is a very malleable thing. Our brains are very malleable. And the more you train it to be skimming and only reading the headlines or whatever it is, the more you do that, the more you're training your brain to be like, nah, I don't need this part of this. <laughs> you know, and it's just the truth. Now you can get that back, but it's gonna be harder to rope that back in the future. So just try to keep it in the now and actually caring about stuff. There's always gonna be something to be angry about, upset about, and there's always gonna be something in the world to be positive about. But we're not gonna get that information if we're shallow with everything. The next thing is, Twitter is extremely manipulative. Now, whether that's by design or by default, it's very biased. Um, most of the headlines about any topic, when you go on to the, the featured posts or the featured tags or whatever, they're very biased towards one political spectrum. And it's really obvious, it's becoming more and more obvious. They use fact checkers that don't even know the facts. Um, for example, I looked up a California law directly on the California website. It said one thing and the fact checker said, nope, doesn't say that. So <laughs> it's, we have a problem on the internet. We're not gonna solve it today. And you have to be aware of that. The other thing that's important to know, even beyond the bias of the platform itself, bots and the fake paid accounts. This is an absolutely and 100% real According to the freedomhouse.org, which is an organization that does um, a lot of audits of internet freedom around the world different, in different countries and different governments, they say, in addition to human commentators, both state and non-state actors are increasingly creating automated accounts on social media to manipulate online discussions. In at least 20 countries, characteristic patterns of online activity suggested the coordinated use of such bots to influence political discourse. Thousands of fake names and profiles can be deployed with the click of a mouse, algorithmically programmed to focus on certain critical voices or keywords, which I have definitely experienced. Because guess what? I deal with guns. So this is nothing new to me, but 
Here we go. They are capable of drowning out dissent and disrupting attempts to mobilize collective action online. Another report said that over 30 countries, 30 different governments have mobilized bots or paid actors, because sometimes they're real people or they're a hybrid of the two, to influence political policy. The fact that bots are so sophisticated that you think that you are arguing with a person but you're actually talking to a robot, the future's now. <laughs> I have an article on my website that I'll link in the description along with some of the uh, references. But I wrote an article about are you arguing with a robot because I saw all these people arguing with bots and being absolutely frustrated because they're like how could this person be so so blatantly hypocritical and crazy and illogical? Well, I don't know, because they're a robot? <laughs> Especially in 2020, because between the riots and BLM and the COVID and blah, 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 there was a lot of opportunity for bots to get involved and, and crank that five up to 11. And I saw two robots from the other, both sides, both sides. I don't know how they were created. I don't know if it was Frankenstein's monster where the guy creates something and then doesn't have any control over it. But they were arguing with each other. Two robots arguing with each other. It's crazy. We live in a crazy world. The internet is a whole different dimension, so that needs to be in our minds when we go on there. It is not real life, and people need to realize that. So I do have an article on how to spot it. It's not perfect, but it is a very good way to kind of get a gist of who you might be talking to or who might be making those crazy comments in the comment section. And then there are just crazy people. Don't bother with them. They're just angry about something else in their life. <laughs> so here's the other thing that freedomhouse.org said. It said, According to estimates by cloud services provider Imperva and Capsula, I don't know who that is, bots made up 51.2% of all web traffic in 2016. Now that's a while ago. Think about how many more bots there are on the internet because I've noticed a massive, massive, massive increase in bots. And it's, it's almost, well, it is annoying. Now that also includes good bots because they scroll web pages and help Amazon and all that stuff, so they're helpful ones. But here's the little trick about that. Um, malicious bots, the bad ones, are unidentifiable by design and have made up the majority of bot activity since 2013. The majority of bot activity since 2013 were malicious bots. Can you imagine? They can be used for hacking, spamming, stealing content, and impersonating humans in public discussion. Hmm, interesting. I do know that bots exist, and I knew, do know that they have pretty intelligent discussions with people. They're pretty well trained, and then a lot of times accounts hybrid them. So once it gets to a certain point where the bot starts repeating itself and people get a little suspicious, a human comes in and engages. So this is, this is highly coordinated, and people are paying a lot of money yeah, this is good business, basically. Bots are good business. It pays to have America divided. So we need to work on realizing, according to this, half the internet are robots. So let's all take a chill pill, take a deep breath, and realize we might not even be talking to real people. And if we are talking to real people, they might be heavily influenced by crazy robots. The next thing is censorship. A lot of people have been hearing about this for years. And a lot of people don't even believe it. I have experienced it my whole career because I'm, I'm dealing with guns and I'm talking about freedom and personal independence and things like that. Oddly enough, it seems like the algorithm hates those words even more than if I talk about an AR-15 or an AK-47. <laughs> well, can I say that in this video? Will I be demonetized? I don't know. Censorship exists um, on the entire internet and we have gotten that lesson even more so now. Twitter led the way to some extremely disturbing and overreaching violations of, if not legally freedom of speech, the spirit of freedom of speech. Here's the deal. I don't care what they choose to allow or disallow on their platform. I just care that they're transparent. They're a private company. That's arguable, but let's just pretend that they're a fully private company. But if they have a law against, say, nonviolence, well, then they have to apply that evenly, and it's not being applied evenly. We can argue all day long about that, but the facts are the facts, and some people have literally called for violence, while other accounts called for peace, and they inferred that it was some weird conspiracy that they were calling for violence by calling for peace and law and order. So 
<laughs> not to get into the weeds, but either way, it doesn't matter what side of, of politics you're on because freedom of speech is a nonpartisan issue. If you're an American and you value human rights, you have to understand that eroding freedom of speech to this level, even in spirit, is pretty dicey. Just because maybe you agree with the censorship that happened because it happened to be against something that you disliked or fill in the blank, it'll come for you. They will come for you because once you corrode a right, a human right, they will use that against you. There's something called legal precedence, and I've talked about it in another video. If they can censor not only one man who happened to be the president of the United States, if they can completely shut him down, but everything associated with him, even t-shirts, on a server level. I mean, we don't really stand a chance. Not really. If you wanted to make a change and take a stand, I would suggest doing it with Twitter. Because Twitter, like Instagram and Facebook, they get money from their user base. And YouTube gets money from their users' content. I have a love-hate relationship with YouTube. I'm very thankful for YouTube, to be honest. But sometimes it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> but they, they have a little bit more skin in the game because they want content that people like in order to make money. For these other platforms, they only make money if their users are on there. So Twitter is making money because you're on there. They don't really care what you say. They just want you on there. They want time on their platform. And they don't care if their algorithms are created to make you angry or whatever. They want you to stay on that platform. So to get off that platform hurts their bottom line, their money. And that's really kind of the only thing that makes them change anything for these big companies. I get it, they're companies that gotta make money, but that, that if you wanna make a change, that's the way you make a change. So they enacted a whole new level of censorship and that made me very uncomfortable that they led the charge for that. Plus there's not a lot of healthy reasons to stay there and I think that we need to send a message. That's my opinion. If you choose to do that, great. I think is a great thing to do. It's another reason why to totally quit. For all you diehards, and I was definitely one of them, a huge and valid objection is like, don't leave the platform because then there's, then we're not in the fight. There's nobody there. It's going to be an echo chamber and no one's going to get the truth or no one's going to get a different opinion at least to, to wrestle with, to figure out what the truth really is. That is very valid. And one of the biggest reasons why I stayed on the platform for as long as I did, because I was like, no, oh, unless they kick me off this platform, I'm going to be here and I'm going to be a light in the darkness. I'm going to spread positivity and hope as much as I possibly can. But guess what? Yelling into that hurricane, your voice is so important on the internet. Don't think it isn't. But is it important on Twitter? Uh, no. Twitter is like that friends group that you have and we've all had one in our life, I'm pretty sure we all have, a force to be friends with, maybe it's a workforce or a team or whatever, and they pick you out. Even though you're trying to be nice or kind or positive, they'll still attack you no matter what because they're just angry people. They're just angry about something else in their life. So they'll gossip about you, attack you, try to cancel you, whatever. They're just terribly sad and mean people inside. <laughs> And Twitter is like that. And the minute that you go elsewhere, because guess what? There are other friends groups out there. And the minute you leave, they go, oh, there's nobody to get mad at. We're going to get mad at each other. And they actually start cannibalizing each other. So considering Twitter is so unhealthy on a universal level, I think just let it burn. You know, you have other places to be a voice in. You can be a voice on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And they all have their pitfalls. They're not perfect. I might be having the same conversation a year from now or even a month or a week from now, but it's still a way healthier platform. It has way more benefits. Twitter, the only use really is to feel like you're up on the news and you're really not. It's biased, it's manipulative, it's full of angry robots. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it was hard for me to quit Twitter. I was always thinking about doing it because I realized it wasn't all that healthy, but I started it because a professional in my field was like, hey, you should have a Twitter account so you can say thank you to people when they share stuff. And I'm like, oh, I guess that makes sense because I thought Twitter was stupid when it first came out. And I would just share my videos or whatever. But then, honestly, when my, I had some personal issues and my uncle died, I went on the, tw the Twitter. <laughs> I went on the Twitter. I sound like some Bernie Sanders. I went on the Twitter. Um, I went on Twitter to, to kind of distract me 
from some of the pain that I was experiencing, to be quite honest. So I just kind of used it as an outlet for my life where there was something that popped up and I'm like, oh, this makes no sense. Let me, let me say something about it. But it really takes you out of the moment of your actual life because it's so easy just to be like, bah, bah, bah. but I decided to only focus on the personal freedom stuff, the constitutional stuff, and also try so hard to be a positivity and a light in the darkness. And a lot of people really appreciated that. And it turned out that I had an amazing audience. You know who you were. And it was so fun to interact with you guys. I had more engagement than the accounts hundreds of times bigger than me. It was, it was absolutely crazy because I, I didn't really care about the platform. Um, so I didn't advertise it. You probably didn't even know I had one, if a lot of you watching this video. I had viral tweets um, that rivaled people who had millions of followers. So I had crazy engagement and I really enjoyed it. I loved being a light in the darkness. But then followers started telling me, hey, you know what? The only reason why I go on Twitter is because of you. And then I realized, oh crap. And that was the final nail in the coffin. I realized that I was one of the only reasons why people go on a highly toxic platform and maybe you're luring some of your friends there because they enjoy interacting with you but it's not healthy for them so it's like going to a party and looking for your good friend there but the party sucks <laughs> the party is full of a bad environment people are doing bad things it's not very fun people are angry there are fights starting <laughs> And meanwhile, you're like, hey, across the party, hey, hey, friend, and you're having a great time. And then that friend leaves and you're stuck at the party. And then you're in that environment and somebody starts to fight with you and you start fighting back. I didn't want to be the only reason why somebody goes on a toxic platform. That's not healthy. I have to quit. You need to think about not what you're losing from quitting Twitter, but what you're gaining and you're gaining peace of mind, less anxiety. You'll be more present. You won't be thinking, oh wow, this moment would be so interesting to share on Twitter, or oh, I thought of something clever. I should quickly tweet it out. You're gonna be in the moment way more, and you're gonna have more time. Actually being more informed because you're going to be more informed on the stuff that you actually care about and not what the platform wants you to care about. You won't be led by the nose like a farm animal to whatever is the most exciting thing of the day. If it's not news, it's some dumb celebrity gossip. If it's not gossip, it's some, some tragedy or whatever is the biggest thing to get the most energy. It doesn't even mean if it's negative energy. When I really sat down and looked at it, I was like, oh wow, this is, this took a lot of energy to be, to have as much fun as I really did on Twitter. Um, but again, it's just not, it's just not worth it. I've already noticed a huge uptick in quality of life and I haven't even been gone from Twitter that long. If you do quit, let me know the benefits that you experience when quitting. Put it down in the comments, put down whatever you think I missed so other people can read it. So for those of you that are still on the fence after this video and you've made it this far, I will tell you how to quit Twitter and say, guess what? You don't have to fully quit. Try it for 30 days. Try it for 30 days, deactivate your account, take the app off your phone so you're not tempted to go on it because you will be. You will be. You'll actually go through a little bit of withdrawal sy symptoms if you're really used to being on it all the time. That's natural. You're going to feel a little weird. In 30 days, if you want to start your account again because you can't possibly stay away from Twitter, that's okay, whatever. That's your life. But if you realize after the end of 30 days that your life is just somehow just a little bit better and you feel good about it, then you can completely quit. Just completely delete your account so you don't even count as a user, so they don't even get that benefit in their number base. They don't deserve it, in my opinion. It's all my opinion. So. That's my opinion. If you liked this video and you like talks about personal freedom, let me know in the comments and subscribe to my channel. We got all sorts of fun stuff here. We got guns, personal freedom, constitutional rights, um, and basically everything to make your individual life a lot better. Thanks for joining me.